Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, this, uh, this or next to the last uh, lecture of the series for this, uh, this year, this academic year. Uh, the Institute for Religion and Science would like to welcome you. And um, I, I would like to introduce this evening uh, Dr. Patrick McCauley, a, a professor of philosophy here at Chestnut Hill College, who will uh, introduce our speaker. Hello, as she said, I am Patrick McCauley and I teach here at the college and I'm also a member of the board of the Institute of the Study of uh, Religion and Science. And I'd first like to say I deeply appreciate all the effort it takes to come out to our to our programs. We put a lot of time and thought into it and we spend a lot of time communicating with the individuals who come and speak for us. But in the back of our mind always is the audience that actually comes out. And I'd like to really uh, give my appreciation for the, particularly on a stormy day like we had today, to, of making that effort to come out. And if you know anybody else, you might want to offer them a ride. <laughs> Also, uh, we, we were been, we've been speaking about uh, having Dr. Paul Knitter here for uh, well over a year, and I personally have been very excited about it, having spent so much of my own graduate work on Paul Tillich, uh, Professor Knitter being uh, an expert on uh, the, the theology of Paul Tillich. Paul Knitter is an emeritus pro uh, Paul Tillich Professor of Theology, World Religions and Culture at Union Theological Seminary in New York. He is also the Emeritus Professor of Theology at Xavier University in Cincinnati. He received a licentiate in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome in 1966, and I found out earlier today that he was uh, there on the ground when the, uh, the bishops showed up to start the process of the Second Vatican Council. And uh, I was remaining quiet in the back, but I was a little jealous. <laughs> He then went off to the University of Marburg in Germany, and where he got his doctorate in 1972. Again, jealousy in the back row. <laughs> Most of his research and publications have dealt with religious pluralism and interreligious dialogue. If you've been to any of our, our, our talks and our presentations here at the Institute, the main goal, the main emphasis that we try to perform with these, with these presentations is the idea of civil dialogue between various factions and polls within a debate. And I don't know, I don't know if we've ever had someone here who more fits the bill of civil dialogue between various factions than Dr. Paul Knitter. Uh, I was very pleased and proud when I was asked to be the person to introduce him, and I would like to introduce Dr. Paul Nitter right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. And, and good evening, everyone. Thanks for braving the elements, the elements are out there, for, to be here this evening. Uh, I certainly am very happy to be here at Chestnut Hill. I arrived uh, later last night and have just been overwhelmed by the, the warmth and the hospitality, the genuine friendliness of everyone here, and uh, by the uh, engagement we had this afternoon with the students. It was really, really exciting. But I certainly have felt very much at home. So happy to be here and honored, a little bit intimidated, uh, at being a part of the lecture series on religion and science. Um, now, the religion part I can handle. Uh, the, the science is, um, uh, I hope I can, I'm not here to speak out of or to what we would call the hard sciences. Uh, I hope what I have to say tonight would be based more on, on social sciences and, and history. Um, but uh, we'll see, we're gonna have a good, uh, amount of time. I want to make sure for uh, conversation after my presentation, and I look very much forward to that. So, the title. Is the history of religions on the brink of a new axial age? That is a rather audacious question for a lecture series in religion and science where you've got to have hard data for everything you, you claim. Well, I think I have some pretty pretty convincing data, and uh, I look forward to, to hearing what you think about it. But the proposal that I'm offering for your consideration is to explore um, 
something that is, I think, as preposterous as it is urgent. Namely, given the geopolitical state of our world today, given the role that religions are playing in that world, that geopolitical world, and the role that, as many are urging, the religions are called to play, but they're not often enough, given also the looming necessity of replacing the clash of civilizations, Samuel Huntington's thesis, with a dialogue of civilizations, this is the proposal. The religious communities that populate our planet have reached a point in their history in which they must find, they must find a new way of relating to each other which will call for a new way of understanding each other. So calling for a new way of relating that will require a new way of understanding the other religion, but also of understanding themselves. Um, namely, uh, the religious traditions and the religious communities of the world are being called to dialogue with each other rather than dominate each other to collaborate so that all may prosper rather than compete so that one may win. And this will require, this will require all religious believers, this is the hard part, to lay aside or radically reinterpret their traditional and their various ways of claiming that my God is bigger than your God. The religions can no longer continue to make the kinds of claims of superiority that most, maybe all, religions in one way or another have made in the past. That my God is bigger than yours or my religion is truer than yours. The challenge that is facing all religious people and traditions can be compared, I think, to the axial shift in, the, in religious history that, as many of you know, Karl Jaspers, German philosopher, identified, and then that Karen Armstrong, very popular writer, has popularized in her book, The Great Transformation. Namely, that just as there was a transforming shift in religious consciousness throughout most of the world, not all, but most of the world, between the period more or less of 800 and 200 BCE, so before the Common Era, there was, a, there was this shift all over the world. And this is when, when Buddha, Socrates, the Jewish prophets, Confucius, Lao Tzu, there, there was a shift in religious awareness um, and in religious reality. So today, there is a growing and, in, and a needed transform, transformative shift, which, though different from the first axial shift, is still just as important as that one was. And so in what follows, mm -hmm. I would like to lay out, first, why such an axial shift away from domination and toward dialogue is necessary, so necessary, and then I will try to explain why it is possible. Because sometimes you might, it's easy to prove necessary, but then the possibility is. Um, and, and of course, what I'm offering this evening is not just my own ideas. I draw this from so many other, other, other authors and other um, um, investigators. So, first of all, the necessity. Um, the first reason. Civil society in America now I'm going to talk especially about our context, has, since the European invasion of what the Native Americans call Turtle Island, we have always been pretty much a multi-ethnic and a multi-racial society, given the reality of slavery. Today, as Diana Eck, in her wonderful book, has shown, it's already more than 10 years old, the title is A New Religious America, How a Christian Country, this is the title, has now become the world's most religiously diverse nation. 
The United States, especially after the change in our immigration laws of the 1960s, has become, and is becoming ever more, a multi-religious society. This means, I think now, that, that the citizens of this country, we, you and I, we're called upon today to form not just a multiracial, not just a multi-ethnic, but also a multi-religious civil society. A multi-religious civil society. We have to work together as black and white and yellow, as Italian, Puerto Rican, Vietnamese, and also now as Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, of course Jewish, always been part of it. Such a multi-religious civil society, now this is my point, demands more than tolerance of other religious differences. To form, I think, to form a working, enduring, multi-religious nation, we have to not only accept our religious differences, I think we have to affirm them. We have to not only put up with the reality that our next door neighbors now are Muslim, here I'm speaking as the dominant class, I'm white and Christian. We not only have to put up with the fact that our next door neighbors are Muslims, we have to be happy that they are. We have to see our Muslim, I'm using this as an example, religious, we have to see their Muslim religious identity, not only as a fact of life, but also as a good for the life of our country. If we are going to be fellow citizens with our Muslim or Buddhist or Hindu neighbors, we have to feel, at least this is what I think, we have to feel that their religion is as valuable as ours. A diverse civil society requires not only an affirmation of the equal rights of differing races and religions, but also the affirmation of their equal value. Therefore, to make this point rather sharply, I don't believe, and I think all of you would agree with this, that we can have a functioning, prosperous, multiracial society if one race believes that God has made it superior over all other races. To believe in white supremacy is destructive of democracy. Now, I believe that the same holds true for a multi-religious society. It will not function, it will not prosper, if one religion, especially if that religion has a numerical and cultural majority, believes that it is God's preferred religion. Christian supremacy is just as destructive of our democracy as white supremacy. I offer that as a topic to talk about. I think that's true. I may be wrong. I should have, okay. We come to what now is for me the most impelling reason why the religions are being called to an axial shift regarding claims of superiority. Namely, the link between claims of religious superiority and privilege, on the one hand, and calls to religious aggression and violence on the other. Notice the word I just used in that sentence. Um, link. It's a link, not a trigger. I'm not suggesting that theologies asserting that one's religion is the only or the best religion will necessarily or automatically lead to violence in the name of religion. The root causes of religious violence, in other words, violence supported by religion, the root causes of religious violence, I believe, uh, is not religious. Let me just, a bit of a digression to expand on that. Um, if this is kind of a, a generalization. The usual cause of religious violence is as I think it is for most international and intranational violence, economic. Violence becomes a necessary tool either 
to carry out and maintain economic exploitation of one group by another, or to resist and overthrow economic exploitation, either to impose it or to resist it. But now, so that's, it's economic. But if you are a racist demagogue who wants to maintain the exploitation of one race or ethnic group of another, or if you are a revolutionary <laughs> trying to overthrow the shackles of slavery, boy, it sure can help if your cause, it can help your cause if you have at your disposal a religion that holds itself up as God's privileged faith and God's privileged plan for the whole world. If you can tell your followers that they are advancing and defending not only their own cause, but God's cause, God's ultimate vision for the world, God's privileged people, then you will be able to swell your ranks, not only with more soldiers, but with better soldiers. Fighters in state armies, or fighters in resistant movements, whether in the ranks of Al-Qaeda, or the Green Berets, those who believe that God is with us, Gott ist mit uns, as the German soldiers in World War I had on their, their, their belts, then they, that if they believe that they are struggling for God's truth and doing God's will, such soldiers will not only be braver, they will frequently be more brutal, ready to give their lives as they pilot planes that crash into buildings, or drop bombs on villages. As Charles Kimball, Oklahoma University, has argued in his fine little book, When Religion Becomes Evil, wonderful book, I mean, not a happy book, but I think an accurate book, he says one of the principal reasons, though certainly not the only reason, why religion can so easily and this is a problem, so easily be, in, be enlisted to justify or intensify violence, or why religion can so easily be used to declare that the others, the, 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 the terrorists or the imperialists, are the evildoers, while we are the good doers, is because of the way religions have claimed to deliver the absolute or final or superior truth over all others. Absolute Absolute religion, religious truth, um, so easily becomes violent religious truth. That's, again, something I offer for our consideration. Many people will not agree with that. Um, so, if we are to follow Rabbi Jonathan Sachs's admonition in England, uh, Rabbi of the I think the, orth is it Orthodox rabbi John, in, in, in England, Nancy? Uh, um, so he says that unless religions are made into part of the solution for global violence, they will continue to be a major part of the problem of global violence. If our religious swords have any chance of being recast into peaceful plowshares, we're going to have to do something about the way, I think, Religious people, especially religious leaders, have felt the need to insist that they occupy the top place in the hierarchy of religions. So the famous, fairly well-known uh, saying of Hans Kung, some of you I know, have some students from Union here, have heard this frequently from me, Hans Kung's statement, there will be no peace among nations without peace among religions. If, if that is true, but it's incomplete. We must add, and there will be no peace among religions without a mutual mutuality of religions in which no religion claims superiority over the other. Finally, here I can only broadly summarize what is slowly, maybe all too slowly, and urgently becoming clear to religious believers and to environmentalists that if we are going to find a solution for what is perhaps the most menacing and far-reaching of the global challenges facing humankind today, you know, the possibility that human beings 
are going to destroy the life-sustaining capacities of this planet. If, if we're going to confront that problem, then the religious communities of the world are going to have to make their con contribution. I'll give you two considerations why I think that is true. First, this is more personal, if the purpose of religion, and not the purpose, if one of the purposes of, of religion is to help people face the problems and sufferings of the human condition, and if the environmental crisis is on the top of that list, then it is about time that the religions recognize that the one earth is calling the many religions to a new and mutually shared responsibility. To state it forthrightly and sharply, I, I believe that if any religion, whatever it is, does not have a message, it'll be different messages, but have some message that can help us deal with the threat of ecological devastation, then that religion had best be assigned to a place in museums and history books. Such a religion is no longer relevant. Boy, that's a sweeping statement, isn't it? Oh, what the heck. Uh, I, I really, or, or I can say that more theologically. Such a religion that has nothing to say, or maybe even is a problem for the environmental crisis, I don't see how that religion, from my perspective as a Christian, uh, can really be coming from God. At least the God that I know through Jesus of Nazareth. Secondly, Secular, and now this is, this is more on the, in line with our science and religion theme. Secular environmentalists are coming to the recognition. Secular environmentalists, those that have no religious belief whatsoever, would call themselves atheists, agnostics, are coming to the recognition that the environmental problem is more than a secular technical problem. It is a spiritual problem. They are realizing not only that the problem is often caused by religious beliefs, the environmental problem often caused by, what do I mean by that? The belief, for instance, that the world isn't our true home and therefore it is not that, not that valuable. I mean, a lot of religious people believe that. Or that after God created the world, he turned it over to serve and, to, to, and be dominated by human beings. That's another problematic religious belief that causes all kind of environmental problems. But still, environmentalists are also coming to see, now this is the point I want to mention and, and stress, that the ecological mess we're in requires the help of spiritual values and beliefs. If we are going to really make the effort to save this earth and to subordinate our own, our human, often consumerist needs to the needs of the planet, then we are going to have to feel about this planet differently. We will have to feel feel that we are, that this planet, this earth, is part of us and that we are part of it. In other words, we will have to feel that it is, it is sacred in some way. To perceive and feel and affirm our relationship with rocks and, planet and plants and animals is to feel that which, is to feel that which connects them with us and grounds their value and sacrality. It is to feel what some religious persons would want to symbolize as spirit, or as Tao, or as Dharma, or as Bod Buddha nature, or as Wakantanka and the Lakota people. Namely, that which grounds everything and connects everything, and indeed makes us family. I think E.O. E. Wilson calls this biophilia, a, a love of life, a love of the planet. If environmentalists are concluding that in order to protect the earth, we have to love it, that's what Wilson said, who was an atheist, religious persons are suggesting that they can help foster such love for the planet. But for the religions to make this necessary spiritual contribution to the environmental challenge, what is needed is not just that each religion assemble its environmental prophets and lobbyists. We need that, we need that, but we need more. We need a joining of ranks. We need 
an interreligious environmental voice and lobby where the religions come together to collaborate together. One earth calling all religions together to care for that one earth. The earth needs the help of the religions and the religions will not be able to effectively provide this help unless they get their act together. And one of the conditions it seems to me for getting their act together is to lay aside this, this competition, domination, I'm better than you, and collaborate. But is all this possible? Can, we, can this really happen? And so we move to what I want to give some considerations, why this, why, why, why this is not just a pipe dream. That the religions can really move towards this kind of a, of a shift. Um, but making the case that superior religious truth claims are dangerous is, I think, that's the easy part, as I said. It's a lot more difficult to argue that such claims of superiority are not necessary to be religious. They do not have to be part and parcel of the way religions work. That has been the case. I'm not denying that. I'm just saying it doesn't have to continue to be the case. I think there are good reasons why all religions, even if in the past they have claimed to be God's favored and final religion, need not and should not continue to do so. I, I'm going to give you three arguments for this arguments, three reasons. We, academics always going to argue, especially the male academics going to argue. Um, theology, mysticism, and psychology. First, theology. Um, I think it can be shown how in all the religions of the world, woo, in the academy you're never supposed to say all. You're not supposed to make universal claims. That's postmodernism. No universal claims. I'm doing it anyway. Um, and I think I have reason to do it. From the earliest so-called primal religions to the latest of the so-called world religions, I guess that would be Baha'i, I'm not sure, there is the recognition in all of them that no matter how certain they are that God has, has revealed God's self to them, or no matter how certain they are that they have really discovered eternal truth, Buddha under the, under the Bodhi tree, um, there is always, they, all of them recognize in one way or another that there's more to come, that there's more to know. There is always a surplus in what they know, in what has been revealed. Always a surplus. Even though they don't all use the same word, all religions in one way or another, I said, some more explicitly, admittedly, and consequentially than others, affirm that they are dealing with the word that, that I would use, I think, mystery ultimate reality is ultimately mystery. What they have come to know in various religions is in its very nature more than they can ever know. It is beyond words, though words are necessary. It is, the term is ineffable, F fully beyond articulation. And this means, it seems to me, if all religions admit this, that they're dealing with that which they can never fully know, um, that means that there, no religion can, be, had, can have the final, the full, the unsurpassable revelation of holy mystery. It's a contradiction in terms to say, we're dealing with mystery, but we got the final word. <laughs> it just, I mean, this is a contradiction within my own Christian theology. Because Christian the Christianity has said both things. And I don't see how you put them together. Well, we can talk about that. Um, no revelation and no religion built on revelation can say it all. There is always something else, something more that can be said. Now, this does not rule out, understand me, please, that some particular religious teachings or doctrines or practices can be more accurate in what they say about holy mystery. And therefore, in certain cases, to be preferred, this rather than that. <laughs> Nor does it doesn't mean that some truth claims 
of religions are false. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of religious stuff out there that is c held up to be true, and I think most of us, my God, that can't be true. I mean, so this does not, this is not relativism. This is not anything goes. The, the, but so you, to, to adjudicate, to decide, you know, what is more preferable, what is we, something we would have to say is that just doesn't make sense. This we work out in study and dialogue and conversation. What holy mystery or the ineffability of the divine renders impossible is the claim, as I said, by any religion to be in general the only and the final and in, in that sense superior religion over all the others. That's just, as I said, a contradiction in terms. If religions deal with mystery, then all religions can be nothing more than a limited expression of mystery. As a t-shirt uh, once put it, uh, I got it, God is too big to fit into any one religion. Jews, Christians, and Muslims have a word for any finite expression that holds itself up as the only or the definitive or the infallible container of God's truth. Jews, Christians, Muslims would call that idolatry. And I think we have committed the sin of idolatry often enough, we talking about Christians. Um, well, we move on. If theologians tell us that no one religion can contain all of holy mystery, the mystics encourage us to find it in many religions. And the mystics make the claim, that claim, not on the basis of logic or research, but of their own particular religious experience. I do believe that when you read the writings of the mystics in various religions, one of the things that becomes quite evident is that the more deeply they, the mystics, enter into the depths of their own religious practice, whether it's Christian or Muslim or Jewish, the more they realized that what they are discovering in their own tradition cannot be contained in their own tradition. They learn that in, by deepening their experience of their own tradition. Consequently, their minds and eyes and religious sensitivities were open and eager to find that mystery elsewhere. Mystics are essentially dialogical, open to others. This tells us that the deeper one enters into the experiential core of one's own religious experience, the more broadly, the more perceptively, one will be to appreciate and recognize the value of other traditions. Now this is, this is kind of lofty. Let me just give you an example of one particular mystic who's done this. Um, you're gonna be hearing about him in the next speaker in this series, Thomas Merton. Chris Premok from Xavier University is gonna be here for the next talk, I'm gonna be talking about Merton and mysticism. Thomas Merton is a clear and inspiring illustration of what I'm talking about. In his early years, if any of you have read earlier on his, his uh, autobiography, Seven Story Mountain, um, in that book he has some pretty, pretty denigrating things to say about other, especially Eastern religions. But as the years in Gethsemane, uh, Gethsemane Abbey in Kentucky, passed, as he sunk ever more deeply into the mystery of Christ and of his own oneness with Christ, the more he was able to appreciate, to study, to engage, to learn from the truth that he found in Buddhism, in Taoism, and in Sufism. Let me read you a quote from Merton from his Asian journal. So this is from the talk, the last talk that he gave in his life. True communication, this is Merton, on the deepest level is more than a simple sharing of ideas, of conceptual knowledge, of formulated truth. The kind of communication that is necessary on this deep level must also be the communion. Communion beyond the level of words a communion in authentic experience. The monk must be ready, must be wide open to life and to new experience because he has fully utilized his own tradition and gone beyond it. 
There it is. He's utilized his own, he's talking about his fellow male monks. They have utilized their own tradition and gone beyond it. This will permit the monk to meet a discipline of another, apparently remote and alien tradition, and find a common ground of verbal understanding with him on the basis of that mystical communion. Merton was not just a mystic, he was a prophet as well. Finally, in responding to the concern, now this is an objection I get frequently, um, the concern that if we remove the conviction that my religion is the best, we will diminish our commitment to it. That's the argument, uh, uh, and it's a valid argument. I mean, uh, um, I, I appeal to what I, th I, I think is the psychology of faith, or better, the psychology of trust. I mean, the word fides in Greek pistis means trust. Now here, I ask those of you here tonight who consider yourselves in one way or another to be religious believer, believers to ask yourself, just why are you committed to the teachings or to the truth that your religion proclaims? Why are you a Buddhist or why are you a Christian? I suggest that it is because you trust that what you believe, what Jesus taught, what the Torah contains, what the Quran makes known, what the Buddha, what the Buddha embodies, you trust that it's true. You found that it makes sense for the way you want to live your life. This is why you believe, why you are committed, because you find that it, it's true. It works. Not because you are certain that it is the only truth. Now, is that right? You believe because you know it's true. I don't think it's because you know it's the, it's the absolute only truth. If the preconditions for commitment were not just that we trust something to be true, but that we have assurance that it is the only, or even the best truth, then I, I can't see how religious commitment would be possible. <laughs> or any other commitment. If in order to marry my wife Kathy over 31 years ago, I had to know that she was the only woman I could ever marry, I would never have gotten married. It took me long enough to make up my mind anyway, but I never would have done it then. So to give up claims that my religion is better than yours, to give up claims that my religion is better than yours will not, it seems to me, necessarily jeopardize my fidelity to my own religion. Indeed, I do believe that religious commitment really is a lot like marital or partner commitment. If the commitment is working, <laughs> If the truth and the good that one finds in one's religion or in one's partner is real and life-giving, if the relationship, in other words, is healthy, then the encounter with other truths or other people who are equally true and good, and maybe even in some ways more attractive, will not at all jeopardize one's original commitment, I think. Indeed, such encounters with, and friendships with others what one learns from them will deepen and enrich, enrich one's primary commitment, one's original commitment. To be fully committed to a particular religious tradition, I think we have to have some assurance that it is true and good. We do not have to have assurance that it is the only truth or the only good. Commitment requires trustworthiness it does not require superiority. Again, I want to see if that makes sense to you. So, if the considerations I've offered to you this evening make any sense, if, and you'll tell me in a little bit, that is, if it is true that there are great dangers for any religion to claim that it bears a God-given superiority and finality over all other religions, and if it is true that such assertions of superiority, although they have been made by all religions in the past, are not necessary for the continuing life and vitality of religious identity, 
then I think we can conclude that religious believers in all traditions, this is the proposal, are obliged, obliged, a kind of an ethical imperative. And they are able to make what, what I'm calling, and you don't necessarily have to use this expression, what I'm calling an axial shift in the history of religions. So in conclusion, I'd like to spell out four qualities that I think need nowadays to distinguish any man or woman who calls, who wants to call herself or himself religious. Again, this is, this is an opportunity, I mean, it's rather bold and aud audacious, but I feel I'm with friends, so I'll just throw it out and you're gonna tell me what you, what you think. This is, I think, these, these, these qualities are, are necessary, are important for anybody who wants to be religious. Um, the first, Humility. No religion will claim a general superiority over all others. Okay. In this new axial period of religious identity and relationship, we will not, religious people will not approach other religious people with claims of, or, or, or even feeling that my religion is better than yours. So religious believers may be convinced, I hope they are, that what God has revealed to them, or what, what they have discovered, is the truth and nothing but the truth, they will not say the whole truth. Yes, it is the truth. It is, we hope, nothing but the truth that Jesus has revealed, but not the whole truth. To really experience the reality of God, or to be enlightened, I'll use Buddhist terms, is to automatically necessarily to be humble. If you really know God, then you also know that there's more to God than what you know. Saint, what is the, the saying of St. Augustine? Anybody who says they know God doesn't know God. What is it in the, in the, Dao, in the Dao De Ching? Um, what is the opening line of the Dao De Ching? Those who, who, who claim to know the Tao do not know the Tao. Um, so, humility. But, in this new period, religions will continue to make, now this is the, uh, we haven't talked about, universal truth claims. This is important to really get, I mean, to, to, to round out what, I'm, what I'd like to talk about with you. There is a big difference between the conviction that one has a truth that is universally meaningful for all people, and that's different from the conviction of possessing a truth that is absolutely superior over all other religious truths. The difference between universality and absoluteness. Religions cannot, here's where I'm maybe still an old-fashioned Christian, I, I, I entered, Long ago, um, I was a missionary in a missionary religious order, and maybe I still remain a missionary, but here, religions cannot avoid making universal claims. And what I mean, in a sense, all religions, I think, are missionary. They want to spread what they think is the good news they have been given, or the good news they have discovered. This is natural, but such good news. In other words, what I, uh, what I feel, what I have discovered to be true in the, in the message of Jesus of Nazareth, I believe is truth and it's real, it's important, not only for me as a Christian, but I think it's, it's important for everyone. That I'm not saying that they have to be Christians, no way, but that they know about this truth. Maybe they have it already, fine. But I want to make, th this truth is universal. But such good news will not be presented as the only or the final good news. Religions will share their good news, their distinctive truths. They will try to enrich and as well as to challenge each other. But in this way, they will fulfill each other. As Father Jacques Dupuy, a Jesuit who died recently, was in trouble with the Vatican. He pointed out there will be a compliment, complementary fulfillment a complementary fulfillment in which all the religions 
are fulfilled by each other. They preserve their identity and enrich themselves, maybe even transform themselves and their identity through their dialogue with each other. Um, thirdly, third virtue, in this actual shift, axial shift, individual religious believers will be, now this is not easy to pull off, I think, as fully committed to their own tradition as they are truly open to others. Can you? On this personal level, the actual age will provide individuals the opportunity to pursue a spirituality. The opportunity to, to pursue a spirituality. I'm not saying that everybody has to do this. But you'll have, this will be a chance. That while rooted in one's own religion, will draw on other religions to nurture, deepen, expand one's own religious experience and understanding. Now, as some scholars have put it, in this new axial age, we will have the opportunity and for some of us, it's a necessity to be religious interreligiously. To be religious interreligiously. And this leads to, this is a whole other topic, um, to double belonging. That people will, will have the opportunity, and for some it'll be a necessity. For me, it's a necessity. We can maybe talk about that. Um, that, that I, I have to be nurtured by more than one religion. My own, my home religion, Christianity, is, is powerful, is deep, I'm committed to it. I can't, I'm a Catholic, I can't get along without the Eucharist, it's just part of me. But it's not enough. I, I have found that I need Buddhism as well. That's me, that's a number of, 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 of people. That's the, the book I wrote a few years back titled, Without Buddha, I Could Not Be a Christian. And, and I, I, I think it's true. Finally, collaboration. A new globally responsible interreligious dialogue and a, new, uh, and a new dialogue of cultures will, will, will increase. Now, what I'm saying here, I'm gonna summarize this because I'm, I'm going long here, um, that Dialogue will continue. Dialogue will continue, I mean, in this new actual age. Religions will talk to each other, learn from each other, be transformed. But I think among the various kinds of dialogue, the, 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 the so-called academics distinguish a dialogue, a dialogue of life, where, you, where different people from different religions are just living together in the same neighborhood, or a dialogue of study, more of a theological dialogue where you're actually, oh, let me read the Quran, let me read, let me read your scriptures and we'll talk about it. That's more of an academic but important dialogue. Dialogue of spirituality, that's a dialogue more of a mystical dialogue, and the dialogue of action. And that's what I'm talking about, especially collaboration. Collaborare, from, the, from, from Latin, to work together. Um, namely, that, and this gets us back to that, to the, to the part of, of what I said earlier about the environmental crisis. We're fi facing an environmental crisis, we're facing a crisis of violence among nations, we're, we're facing a crisis of, of horrible human suffering due to economic injustice, the horrible disparity in the sharing of the goods. All of these problems are now providing the arena for a dialogue of religions in this new axial age, where religions will act together first of all before they talk about what's your concept of God, what's your belief in the afterlife. Those are important topics, but we'll get to them. We first want to work together to address these, these very pressing issues. Um, and we do so in an attitude of no one has the only or the final or the last word. We want to solve these problems together and draw on the analysis and the differences in, in all of our traditions. Well, that was going to be the end of the lecture. But I'm going to just take five more minutes because after I prepared this lecture, I got into, I can't say I read the whole thing, but a good bit of it, and especially the last part of this book by Robert Bella. Some of you will know Robert Bella, one of the greatest sociologists and, and religious sociologists, I think, of the, of the era. His last book, Religion 
in human evolution from the Paleolithic to the Axial Age. So this is just a study of the religious life up until the Axial Age. And he has, a, he has about you know, 200 pages on the Axial Age. Um, but anyway, what I want to get to is he, he says at the end of his book, to my surprise and my delight, I discovered that in his conclusion, now this is, I mean, based on a tremendous amount of research, he sounded the same call, but based on a much greater amount of scholarship than I could ever put together, the same call that I've been proposing to you, that the religious history of humankind, Bella says, is on the brink of a new axial age. Simply but daringly, he announced, I quote him from page 602, the possibility of understanding our deepest cultural differences, including our religious differences, in a dramatically different way, in a dramatically different way than most humans have ever done before. So he says that in the past, each of them, in other words, the major religious figures of, of the Axial Age considered his own, they were all he's, at least that's the records we have, considered his own teachings to be the only truth or the highest truth. Even such figure as Buddha, who never denounced his rivals, but he subtly satirized them, made fun of them, Plato, Confucius, Second Isaiah, all thought that it was they and they alone who had found the final truth. This we can understand as an inevitable feature of a world so long ago. That's not to say that, you know, they were malicious in any way. This was their conviction in those times. But today, today, now this is his, we have begun to see the emergence of a new point of view one that could understand and appreciate all religions on their own terms and that, that was not driven to set up one as the apex, the top, the best, either because it was the best or because it was the most historically progressive. So what he's saying is, is that he summarizes his hope for the, I think this, this next quote really it much more succinctly summarizes it, uh, in these words, um, what I am thinking of now is the increasing number of serious students of religion who can accept religious pluralism as our destiny without making a claim to the superiority of any one tradition. We can realize that we're, that, to put it in old-fashioned, Christian theological terms, God wants there to be many religions. Religious diversity, plurality, as a good friend, a Buddhist friend of mine, Rita Gross, some of you know, she, religious diversity, what's the problem? That's the way things are and the way things need to be. Well, is this prospect, though, of a new axial age in which religions will give up their claims of having the only or the superior truth meant to supersede all others, in which they will truly enter into a collaborative dialogue in which each can learn from the other for the well-being of all. Is this a pipe dream? Is this real? Or is this something an academic can concoct, you know, in his study? Uh, is it worth one's energies? to try to bring about this new axial age in one's own religious community? I don't know. Maybe it is a pipe dream. But I've been at it too long to give it up now. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, I hope that many of you, especially younger people in the audience, may someday say the same thing. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Professor Nitter. That was really, really interesting. 
Uh, and I would like to take the opportunity now to open up the floor to some questions. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be Donahue. Yeah, go ahead. You got it. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's give him the. Clip. Over the years, I've heard the term mystic and mysticism one, used one, many times. Yes, I'm almost 80 years old, and to this day, I've never had a good explanation of what is a mystic. The closest I ever come to hearing a description is for someone to say a mystic is a person mm -hmm. who regardless of education has a profound intuitive understanding of complex theological concepts. Am I right, wrong, or heading in the right direction, or all wet? Well, um, you're right in what mysticism leads to, but not in what it is. All right. Uh, I, I think, and, <laughs> excuse me, I got a bad. I don't have an absolutely certain answer to this. I mean, I, I, you got the question, I have the answer. But this is, this is what, I, what I, I, from my limited study and such, a, a mystic, and, and, I, and I would invite other people too to, to please add to this or, or, or qualify it. But a mystic is a, is, a, is, is a person who, in some circum, in, 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 because of the circumstances they're in, because of their tradition, have come to their own personal experience of something more, of something greater, of something that, 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 again, mystical experience is beyond words, that's why I'm struggling. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's a unitive, unitive is a key word, it's a unitive experience of, of one's own identity that come, connects with, maybe a better way, merges with, is part of something greater, something, a presence, a, a reality. Now here use a Tao, a, a spirit that when you, you experience, you, you have this sense of, one mystic, the way one mystic puts it, Julian of Nor Nor Norwich, all will be well, no matter what happens. And, you know, something happens, but that's okay, I'll deal with it. This sense of, of, of inner peace, or ability to engage, and secondly, I'm secondly, one, two, three, um, but also a sense of connectedness with other beings. So that you sense, you find yourself caring for others. With genuine, Buddhists say compassion, Christians will say love. Um, uh, that, so it's this sense of, 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 of unitive experience in which yourself, yourself with a, again, I'm, I'm quoting from, from Thomas Merton and also some Mahayana Buddhist writers, your, yourself with a small s somehow becomes part of a, a larger self, a, a larger reality, and that grounds you in peace and connects you in compassion with others. And when you have that experience, you say, ah, I know what, what, it, what it means. Now when you talk about God as spirit, Oh, I know what, the, what, the, what, the, what the, you mean when you talk about God as parent, as father, as mother. Ah, oh, that's the feeling. I get it. Or Jesus as the son of God. Yeah, he got it. I see. In other words, there's where you, what you said enables you to understand some of your theological or doctrinal statements. If I may put this into a oh, please. much more profane uh, description, uh, I get the feeling that it's like Louis Armstrong answered when he was asked, could he describe jazz? And his answer was, if you have to ask, you'll never understand. Am, am, I, am I, again, totally off base with no, this? No, 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 that's exact right. I mean, and it's not, it's not just like mystical experience is like the experience of jazz. That's, I think, what, what you're getting at. Yes. I would even go a step further and say that Jazz can be a mystical experience. Mm -hmm. You know, music, art, that's what art, that's the power of art. The arts put us, that's, that is, that's it. You're, you know, you're not necessarily talking about a god, but it, it, 
it's good. <laughs> it's right. It feels. Good. I mean, it 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 it's connect you. You walk out afterwards, and you you got a bounce in your in your step or so. Professor, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very welcome. Who, who would like to ask the next question? Uh, okay, I'm we gonna let you. We have a lot uh, of people. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, my thoughts are a little jumbled. It'll take right. weeks for me to yeah. sort it out, so I hope I'm not rambling, rambling too much. I'm not disagreeing with your points, but I'm speaking as someone who uh, years ago put a considerable amount of time and energy and research and thought and prayer into selecting a particular religion that I was actually explicitly thinking best religion. Okay. So I'm thinking for myself and also, also the person who is a religion because, simply because they were born into it. So I'm wondering what, what basis should one have for selecting a religion? Is it no different than, uh, you know, I like jazz instead of rock? Or is there actually any spiritual significance to choosing one or another? Or could we just as well throw the dice and get the same result. Mm -hmm. Very good. It was kind of like uh, one of the questions we got from, was the student here? Uh, yeah, she's back in the... Ah, there you are. Yeah, the, the student is at a, a similar question. Um, and at that point, I turned for help. <laughs> to other, does anybody want to take a stab at this? Excuse the expression. Anybody want to engage this? <laughs> Just, and then, yeah, please. I like what the uh, Muslim teacher Sayed Hossein Nazar commented about religion. He said, God does not ask of us to explain the existence of plurality of religions in this world. God only asks us to take care of our own souls in the tradition in which we were born. And I think that's a beautiful saying. And Professor, I'm sorry, I did not like your talk. I, I felt you emasculate religion, and the real enemy is not religion. The real enemy is powerful states and powerful corporations. And to emasculate religion, you have to believe in something to be able to fight these things. So I understood what you were saying, and I could appreciate it, but I think it's not relevant, really, to the situation that we're living in today. I'm sorry, but that's how I feel. Thank you. No, I, I very, very much want to your, your opinions. Can we, I want to get back to that. Let's just uh, take um, this, this question first, but, but by all means, I would like to, to, to return to that. Please. I think the way that you pick a religion, as it were, is, is that it speaks to your heart. That when you have a set of beliefs or you have a, um, an experience, even going back to the mysticism, it's something that strikes a core a center part of you and then and then you know you just know that that's it for you which puts it on a similar level to saying i like jazz instead of rock music well like well, is more of an intellectual thing it's not it's not something that strikes the core of your being but 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 what we are saying or what i'm excuse me what i'm proposing is that i mean your analogy is somewhat close. I mean, I, I, as a Christian, I'm saying that what I understand to be the mystery of God is also available in other traditions, not just in my Christian tradition. So in other words, what I understand to be God, ultimate mystery, part, what, so insofar as I understand it, I find that that in fact, my Catholic Church has told me I'm supposed to believe this. You know, in the Second Vatican Council, that God is revealing God's self, God is saving in other religions. So in a sense, you can come to an authentic experience of divine mystery in many different ways. So in one sense, it's not, I mean, it's, it's not a roll of the dice, because they are different. They are really different. But they are, they are vehicles by which you can come to an authentic experience. Now, what, what criteria do you use? I think, I think the, the earlier criteria, and you were getting at it right, right here, ma'am, of, of a, is, it, is it a religion that truly satisfies your soul and opens you to care for others? 
if it's doing that, you're, you're on the way. Now, why this one rather than that one? That I think, and here I'm going to appeal to Hinduism a bit. Hindus say, you know, the differences of religion depends to to some extent on our on our different psychological types. I mean, some they 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 have different emphases and different traditions. Some are more a little bit more intellectual, and Judaism tends to be more. I mean, the 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 the, the, the the need for study, the need for argumentation. Uh, I, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but it, it will it'll depend upon your disposition, your personality. But also, kind of getting back to a little bit what you said, and my, I've been, I grew up in Christianity, and that's my religion. And while I have found it, it to have real problems, fundamentally, that's my tradition. I've just been conditioned for it, and as I said, I'm happy that I was conditioned to be to be a, to be a Christian. So it's it's there are more than one way to come to authentic religious experience, and the important thing is not to know that, as I said, that this one is in itself better than the other, but that this one really does the job for me. Professor, can I jump in for just a second? Just one tidbit on this. Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote a piece in his book, Emile, called The Creed of the Savoyard Priest, in which he gives advice to a young boy on exactly this question. And he ends, after I had this huge, long discussion about the importance of using your own brain in terms of uh, evaluating religious ideas, but he says, return to the religion of your parents, because the symbols that you were raised with are always going to speak with you with greater force than Christmas is, if you grew up with Christmas, Christmas will hit you harder than a, a Hindu holiday or a Muslim holiday just because that was the culture you were raised with, with but it doesn't matter necessarily which one it is, just the one that hits you. Um, so start to look at it, he, he suggests looking at it from that angle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. May I return, and again I want to thank you for your forthright uh, uh, disagreement. Um, two things. Uh, religion, as I tried to say, I don't think religion is not the cause of violence. But religion, and I think I don't, I don't see any way of to deny this, religion is being used to justify violence. And it's not just the Muslims. I mean, it's going on now in, 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 in Sri Lanka. The Buddhists are doing it. Or in Myanmar, what the Buddhists are doing to the Muslims. In Myanmar, it is really it's it. This is a fact that if we're if we want to be religious people and be responsible, we have to ask why is this, and and I don't say that I have the only uh, response to that, but I'm quoting as I said, drawing on other other scholars, that one of the reasons why religion can be so easily exploited, misused is when religions hold themselves up to be the one and only. Um, maybe that's wrong, but I'm just putting that. The reason they can be exploited is because they are centers for, for community building. They galvanize a lot of people. But how do they galvanize? And I think the, a lot of the problems created violence is, is fomented by governments. Oh, no, that's and my it's not religions no, that are doing my, it. My question it's, is, why do the governments oftentimes find it so easy to do that? Yeah. Oh, why, you know, why, why is it that the, it's so easy for governments to do that? And there's no one answer to that, but one of them might be. But the other point is, be faithful to your own. Yes. And um, I have tried in my own personal life to do that. I'm, I still call myself a Roman Catholic theologian. But for some of us, for some people, it is hard to be faithful to their own religion. They have found that their own religion doesn't do it for them for whatever reason. I, and I just want to respect that and recognize the possibility that they might find a greater connection with God through another path. I'm not encouraging that, but I don't want to condemn it. Oh, absolutely not. I was raised Unitarian, but I converted to Catholicism. <laughs> oh, wow. You, you, wow you're, usually it's the other way around. I covered the water. <laughs> <laughs> you're unique. <laughs> Thank you, though. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yeah. Okay, um, I'd like to make a comment on 
why religion can be exploited. Ah, yes. um, <clears throat> um, coming from an Irish background, <laughs> ah. uh, it's very easy for a Protestant or a Catholic who is economically deprived in a given country to be galvanized against those people who are A, going to take my job, and B, have a different religion which doesn't have the truth. So there are economic bases for these things. That's and if you go to Belfast, you can still see them there on the walls yep, today. Yep, yep, yeah. um, by the way, um, I grew up as a Roman Catholic and now belong to the United Church of Christ where <laughs> God is still speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Good, here we go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Give a word or two about uh, technology and the net as, as these might be tools uh, to um, give rise to this possibility and necessity of historical change. Um, it seems to me that there is a parallel between what you're talking about and uh, its symbolic religious language and then the founding reality of technology. I can open up my files, you can open up yours, we each have different modes of access. Um, our machines have entirely different um, um, cookies, et cetera, et cetera. But then um, I cannot make a claim to superiority in anything I do against yours. We have to communicate and in the process relate back and forth until we get sick and tired of it and move on to something else. But whatever the, the, the end um, of it might be, um, sometimes um, true um, sympathies and even affections and commitments occur over these founding technological uh, givens. And you were asking about hard facts. I think, I think actually that technology provides the hard facts for the kinds of things that you're speaking of symbolically here. And I throw in a lot of William James also to what you've uh, been uh -huh. talking about. Yeah, uh, well, I'd like to hear more about your, how you would throw in William James too. But no, you, you're, thank you very much for that. And that's something I just didn't consider, but in, 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 indeed, in, in Bella's and in other, in other uh, historical uh, studies of the axial age, you know, what, what brought about what enabled this, this shift that happened in China, that happened in Greece, that happened in, 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 in Palestine, Israel, um, that so much of it had to do with material developments, I mean, what they call technology, but material developments insofar as it was the development of money and commerce and the new ways of going about market. These were all conditions that made it possible for the shift to take place that even kind of not just made it possible, but made it necessary. So your consideration that now with our, with our social networks and our, our ability to communicate and to carry on the kind of interaction and engagement that is now possible because of technology is not only a, um, and not, not only something that makes it possible, but maybe that's something that is just going to make it inevitable. And I find that encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, please, Frank. Hi. Uh, thank you much, uh, Dr. Nitter. I really appreciate the overall thrust of your argument, Paul, and I think uh, uh, I have a small point there to ask about that, and then I want to return to the concept of mysticism and make a couple of comments Oh, yeah, about please. That. So overall, I think uh, one of the most interesting things you've opened up is that the political use of religion is not religion. Yeah. And we mm -hmm. can't fault religion for yeah. what many of us in different faith communities do with political motivations about things like land tenure, access to resources that breed mm -hmm. conflict. Um, in regard to the overall structure, I follow your argument and I believe the drift of your argument is, you know, it, by my lights, correct. But one thing that puzzles me is I'm not puzzled at all about the positioning of, of Section 3, but if I were doing this paper in my own voice, I would have repositioned 1 and 2. In other words, I would have started with the poss possibility ah. and then treated necessity. And I think that might mean that I don't 
exactly understand your meaning of necessity. So let me explain what I think possibility and necessity mean to me. Ah, and please, then I yeah. would love to hear more about your use of necessity. So I think of possibility as basically three different kinds of things. Logical possibility, there's no self-contradiction in it. Empirical possibility, it's in accord with the laws of nature. Technical possibility, we can prove or use it. And then I think of necessity as either physical necessity, maybe like old Newtonian mechanics, mm. or logical mm. necessity. Or, I'm sorry, or? Or logical necessity. Mm. So A is A, is a necessary truth. Um, but I felt that your treatment of necessity was a little opaque to me, and I would have started with possibility, mm. maybe mm -hmm. trying to make a case something like maybe Swinburne's idea that um, the meaning is more important than the proof. So if I can ah. demonstrate the coherence of theism, then I've done something big, and maybe we'll never demonstrate the necessity of, mm -hmm. of theism. So I'm a little puzzled about necessity. And then I'll throw the second comment and love to hear your response about both. So mysticism, somebody raised that. Yes. Very yeah. interesting question. I don't think I'll ever understand it, but one writer I admire has defined it as uh, the belief that there's some action guiding knowledge that cannot be put into words. There's some action? Some action night guiding knowledge that cannot be put into words. Example would be in the Tao Te Ching, a text that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So the Tao that can be told is not the eternal that's Tao. That's it, that's it. First verse. But in the text, maybe somewhat paradoxically, we get all kinds of injunctions to act in certain ways. Be like water. Be like the baby. Don't stand out. Take the path of non-contention. So it looks like that definition might fit there, but that, that might be if we have an ethical concern about action-guiding knowledge. More broadly, I think, mysticism is, as you were explaining it, something that I might call a recognition of the interdependence of beings depending on which perspective, whether it's ecological or social activism. So I see Leopold, Gandhi, Buddha, and, and um, Martin Luther King as basically each in their different way recognizing the interconnections. So those are my two thoughts. Wow, thank you, thank you, Frank. Um, wow, well, can't do justice to that, but I, thank you for this question on the necessity part. And I think, and, and this is what, if, if I do this again, in fact, I'm doing it again tomorrow. Um, but but um, uh, I would, and when I do it, to make clear what I think the necessity I'm talking about is not logical necessity, or it's an ethical necessity, an ethical imperative. Namely, it seems, I mean, it's, ba it seems, it's based on empirical observation. Namely, it seems for the reason that we, that religious people are being called upon, called upon, I mean, are, are sensing the need for religions to cooperate. I believe that too. And, and I think that's more and more than just that we, we've got to, we've got, you know, as, as uh, we gotta get along with each other. Because otherwise we're just, we, we, what we've done in the past would, it seems to be making things so much worse, now worse than ever. So it's an ethical imperative and my, now, now comes the logical part. If there is an ethical imperative to, for religions to talk with each other, to dialogue, then it seems to me, and this, this may be the weak link, but it seems to me that if, you want, if we understand dialogue, conversation between two, whether it's just two people who say, I really want to enter into a conversation with you, and to learn something, a dialogue where we're really going to be honest with each other, we're going to tell each other what we think, so that we can both grow, in whatever way ha it happens, in our knowledge, in our understanding of ourselves, and of, 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 of what we hold to be true. If that's what we understand to be dialogue, then I don't see how such an, a process, such an interaction can work if I, if I enter the dialogue convinced that God has given me the final word 
on whatever question of truth that comes up. It's kind of like, well, let's have a good game of poker, but I'll get all the aces. You know, I mean, it's dealt. But it just, I mean, I don't want to trivialize this, but it, it just, that just doesn't seem. So it starts with an ethical necessity that through logic seems to call for this moving out away from yes, claims of superiority. Yeah. Now the second point on, on mysticism, you know, yeah, and you know this scholar of Buddhism that you are, um, that as the Buddha said in the Eightfold Path, um, that, that none, of the, none of the meditation, meditational exercises are going to work if you are, unless you are um, acting ethically, right action, right speech, right livelihood. If you are in your actions or in your speech or in the job that you have taken, hurting other sentient beings unnecessarily, all the meditation in the world isn't going to help you. So action, living, is the, the bedrock of mysticism, kind of. And that brings me back to what, what kind of something that I learned from, from one of my teachers back in Germany, Karl Rahner, who, 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 who said, you know, God, kind of, I'm, I'm expanding it, God is not something, not a reality that you know, it's a reality that you do. You know, you live the reality of God in your, in your caring for others. I mean, you, in, in your opening of yourself to others. In receiving, Rahner said, love from others. In receiving love and in giving love, that's, that's, that's the one definition we have. No, two definitions in the New Testament of God, where it says God is, only two times it comes up, and the, the writings by, uh, by, uh, attributed to John, God is love and God is spirit. But if God is love, then when you are accepting love and giving love, you're Godding. You're Godding. God is Godding in you. And that, that opens you up. So Rahner said, an individual who because of circumstances in their life or so has never really been loved will have a hard time ever believing in God. Because that, that, that experiential basis is not there in our living, in our doing, in our receiving. So I think there's a lot, a lot of truth to that. Um, here we go. Oh, I see, good. Yeah, I guess, I'm sorry, my question is down on a kind of a practical oh, mundane please, matter, but I think we might all agree <laughs> that uh, separation of church and state is probably the best constitutional arrangement for flourishing of multiple religions and fostering religious toleration and so forth. And yet uh, a number, a few religions and plus certain divisions of religions believe that the religious sphere and the political sphere should be commingled. So how do you uh, s settle that? Well, um you know, on, on so, your boy, you're, you're, you're right, because if, if it is true, as, if I understood you correctly, what you were saying, how politicians and, and the, the, those who command the powers that be, whether they're political or corporate or economic, they want to make use of religion to further their causes. That's, that's just, it's always going to be the case. Now. And so I, my question is, how do you avoid that? How do you protect yourself? And I agree with you. Seems to me, and maybe I'm just biased as an American, but I think one of the best arrangements is what we have in this country, we don't always live up to it and such, is that separation, that the state will not identify and favor any one religion. Because that just opens the door to, to the possibilities of the state then misusing religion. Now. So there, there, uh, there I have a point of dialogue with my Muslim brothers and sisters. You know, because, you know, that's what I think you had in mind. Um, but on the other hand... Also fundamentalist Christians. Too. And fundamentalist Christians, yes. But on the other hand, my Muslim brothers and sisters said, okay, you know, many, we, got, we get you, we see the dangers, that's something we've got to deal with. But please, 
we don't want to go to the extreme that we see some of you Americans going, where you don't want religion to have anything to say in the public forum. That you have, and religion becomes just something, this privatized possession between me and God. And it's just something personal and private, totally personal, total, totally private, without any implications for the political order. And they said, no, no. I mean, if, if you hold something to be true, it's got political implications. It's got to be realized. But how to do that without favoring any one religion? This is what, you know, we Christians wrestled with this earlier on. Muslims are wrestling with this now. Uh, and, and I think they're doing, they're really some of the, some of the Muslim scholarship, you know, in, in Egypt, but also in Muslim scholars in Europe and the United States are doing some excellent work on this new Muslim theology of state and state and religion relations. One more question. Um, I'm going to ask a question that I would resent if someone asked me it, this question. Oh, uh, not fair. <laughs> <laughs> Moses Maimonides talked uh, about uh, religious progression within the individual uh, spiritual journeyer, that you, take, you go through stages of spiritual or religious uh, development. Is it possible that it's easy to say that you can give up religious exclusivism if you've already gone past that stage. It's easy to say you don't need a car after the car's done the work you needed it to do. So what you're saying, Patrick, is, well, no, wait, excuse me. Are you saying um, that, that in, in terms of, our, of, of what is frequently the kind of de the development or the evolution, you gotta be real careful with these, these kind of terms, I know. Um, in individuals where James Fowler has done so much work in this in this area, um, where you get to a point where you really are committed and dedicated to your religion, to your own faith, but you, because of the depth of your experience, a little bit of what I was t saying in that lecture, you realize that what you're dealing with is cannot be exclusively held in anyone. That's, that seems to be an evolution in people's faith. You could eventually get there, but what about the person who needs to go through the period of exclusivity to get to that location? Well, you, you so if, if it's a question of just, you know, in, in terms of you're dealing with a 16-year-old and they just have to get older, but if you're dealing with a 30-year-old, with a, a I, I don't want to, this sounds so judgmental, but who's not, who's not yet developed in what seems to be a healthy religious development and evolution, the first thing to do is, is to, and this is the kind of the way I, uh, I engage in the dialogue with, with evangelicals and fundamentalist Christians, which is a really hard dialogue. It's easy to dialogue with Buddhists. But, <laughs> the, uh, uh, but the, the point is that I, I don't talk about, can't you see the value? In Buddhism or Hinduism, how can you be? I would never, I start out talking about what Jesus means to me and how I find in Jesus and in the gospel the grounds for opening myself to others. So I mean, in other words, it's, it's and I, I mean, it's, it's kind of John Cobb, who some of you know, a very well-known um, um, Methodist theologian, I believe. Um, says, for him, and he's developed, Jesus is the way that is open to other ways. Jesus is the way, the way, the truth, and life, that is open to other ways. And to, to, just as, and, and evangelicals will say, what the hell does that mean? You know, and, and uh, well, they maybe not put it that way, but, um, but, but, but then you, now we can talk. Yeah. And then we go into the Gospels, but always on the basis of my own commitment. So, in other words, my, my suggestion, then we, we try to see what kind of a change and evolution can take place. But you just don't jump to the pluralist position. They, they, just, they just can't get there. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, do we, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not, one more? Is it? One more challenge and one more, yeah. A short one. Oh, please. Uh, uh, yeah. Do you think that scriptural, in any religion, scriptural literalism and fundamentalism in general is incompatible or compatible with this new age you're talking about? 
Um, that's just, say, literalism. Um, I, I, um, when I look at some of the statements um, in my own scriptures, um, and a little bit, and when I say my own scriptures, excuse me, Nancy, but I mean I, the way we Christians have also draw on, on your, on the Hebrew scriptures. Um, uh, to take some of these passages literally is going to make it pretty hard to be open. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think you got, you're, you're right. And, um, and I think there are passages in the Quran too. This is why, uh, Frank, uh, just to get back to your, to your, to your point, um, um, anyway, Frank, but when Frank, when Frank says, that, uh, and your point also, when you say that, that um, you know, it's really not religion that's the cause of the violence. Yes, it's, it's economic, as we were saying. But that's too easy, because there are reasons within the tradition of my religion for sure, and I know also for Islam, and I know also for Buddhism, Hinduism I haven't studied that, 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 that carefully, um, there are reasons in the texts why it's so easy to kill people in the name of God. I mean, there are texts that are really violent in our scriptures, and if you take these texts literally and absolutely, it, it's, so it's too easy to say, oh, those Muslims, those terrorists, those extremist Muslims, or those fundamentalist Christians, are, they're not real Christians, or they're not real Muslims. That's true, maybe, but it's too easy. You've got to see, wh what are the arguments they're using for their positions? Because they're drawing on the Quran. They're drawing on the, on the scriptures. And we've got to deal with those passages that, that are the grounds for some of these exclusivist or even violent uh, uh, uses of religion. So you're, that's, that's, that can be dicey, <laughs> doing that. All right, I, I would love for you to join me in thanking Dr. Nitter very, very much. Thank you very much. And unlike usual, if you haven't got enough of Professor Nitter, he will be at Bryn Mawr Presbyterian tomorrow night at 7. Oh, so it, it, how could you ever get enough? <laughs> also, we're also going to be welcoming Christopher Pramuk. Is that right, Pramuk? What's that? Pramuk. Right, this is going to be Associate Professor of Theology, Xavier University, Cincinnati, Ohio. And he, the wisdom, Sophia, in the writings of Thomas Merton. And this is going to be on Sunday, April 13th, uh, at 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. The cost will be $25 for the day, lunch included. Uh, this is also on the website, is that correct? All right, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out. Keep in mind, if you need more, there's more tomorrow night. <laughs>